More than thank, Chris. Many thanks indeed, Chris. I'd like us to turn, if you would please turn with me to the letter to the Hebrews. I'm going to read another passage. Uh, we have looked once or twice uh, at Hebrews chapter 1, and I'd like to read the first nine verses at the beginning of Hebrews chapter 2 this time. We read there, Therefore we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him, God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. For he has not put the world to come of which we speak in subjection to angels, but one testified in a certain place saying, What is man that you are mindful of him? or the Son of Man, that you take care of him. You have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honour, and set him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet, for in that he put all in subjection under him. He left nothing that is not put under him. But now we do not yet see all things put under him, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honour, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. Amen. And we do pray that God would bless to us that reading of his holy word this evening. It's Really, the, the beginning of this uh, second chapter I'd like to look at um, and really just focusing on uh, one verse there in verse 3, uh, a question that is asked and a question that is always pertinent, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? It's a question that can be asked at the prayer meeting as much as on a Saturday morning, as much as in a faith mission tent meeting. It's just as pertinent to be asking ourselves that question uh, tonight at the prayer meeting. How shall we es escape if we neglect so great a salvation? It's really the big question. It's uh, really the biggest of all questions and how shall we escape if we neglect so great this salvation that we have in Jesus? As I have said before, as we looked at Hebrews chapter 1, uh, we could really sum up the message of the letter to the Hebrews, the main theme and the main thrust of the letter to the Hebrews is that God has spoken. And we saw that very clearly. Uh, the theme of the book, uh, let's remember, written to a, a Hebrew audience, a, a non-Gentile audience. Um, the theme is Jesus, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. We thought of him as God's revelation and uh, God's reflection too, and also God's Redeemer. We've also thought of him before as uh, how we see Jesus not only superior to the prophets, he's also superior to the angels. And there is more to say about that in the verses that follow this, but here at the beginning of this passage I'd like to focus on this. I haven't had really an awful lot of time to think and prepare about this, uh, but the question remains, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? The question is asked, and the answer has to be that we won't. Uh, no matter who we are, 
we won't escape if we neglect so great salvation. And the fact of the matter is when we look at this passage and when we read read it even, we don't need to read it even very closely. It isn't saying how shall we escape if we reject this salvation. And some do. It isn't speaking of rejecting salvation, but it is speaking of neglecting salvation. That is the word in our English language that is used, neglect, the word used by translation from the Greek. Uh, it could be translated as to be careless of, uh, to make light of, or to have no regard for something. Neglect is a failure to maintain. When something is neglected, it's not that it no longer works, uh, but that lack of maintenance and care and even respect have, have contributed to it breaking down. And it is easy for us to be unconsciously even allowing that to come into a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. It isn't a case of rejecting this great salvation. It isn't a case of us filling our heads and our hearts with the teaching of Richard Dawkins and all others that who have rejected uh, and completely put their turn their back upon uh, the living God. It's not that we think that Ricky Gervais and other atheist comedians are, are the, the way to go. Uh, it's not that kind of rejection at all. It is a, a neglect. A neglect of our personal relationship. A neglect of our uh, salvation. The love that uh, God has for us in Jesus is not reciprocated. It's not shown in return. It's easy for us. And as I say this, friends, I always preach to myself, as I always speak to myself before I speak to anyone, and I would never dare to be otherwise. It's so easy for us to find time for anything um, and anyone, sometimes other than the Lord Jesus. And very quickly, looking tonight at what we see here, just at the briefly in the first few verses, uh, there are some things we need to take to heart if we are not to neglect so great a salvation. In the first place, the word or the words of Jesus Christ. It is, if we think about it, salvation, it is the greatest act of, of, of love saving someone. It's the greatest act of love that humanity will ever know that the Son of God Most High, that Jesus, uh, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, uh, that Jesus, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, has overcome and has prevailed to open the scroll, uh, that he would, would save us and would go to the cross in love for us. Uh, when we think of love, we think of what the word of God has to say about that love. Uh, in Song of Solomon, chapter 8, love is as strong as death. And in another version, passion is as fierce as the grave. And many waters cannot quench love, neither can floods drown it. But it cannot survive neglect. And what we read in the Bible is that the word of God has been given so that we might not neglect our salvation. And there is only one true salvation, as there is only one true Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. He uh, let us not beat about the bush. Some will uh, balk at, not here, I know, but in other meetings and in other gatherings, will we'll be a little bit wary of saying that Jesus Christ is only the way, the truth, and the life. There is no other way. There is no other truth. There is no other life. But we believe that. 
When Jesus said to us, and I've thought of it many times, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. All those other teachings of the New Testament are showing us in God's word that there is but only one salvation. The words of Jesus Christ and also the witness of the Church of Christ is spoken to here in this passage as well. The consistent testimony of the Old Testament uh, as well as the New Testament is that there is only one God, there is only one salvation. But what we also see uh, in the Bible Sadly and strangely, it might seem, is that there is a constant uh, rebellion of a people's relationship with God. And people do not maintain their relationship. We see that so often. And people neglecting that salvation. Despite the prophets, despite the ministry of Elijah and Elisha, and Isaiah and Jeremiah, and Ezekiel and others, things go downhill in the Old Testament. It's not a case that they completely and utterly rejected God. Some did. Some did, and some made no bones about that. But think of it this way. Ahab, for instance, he's, he's recorded that he did evil in God's sight more than all who were before him, but yet at the same time he called two of his sons, he named them after the God of Israel. And despite the fact that it says of him in the word of God that he did more to provoke God than all the kings before him, it doesn't seem as if he completely rejected the God of Israel. He named two of his sons after God but he is guilty of what we call syncretism of neglecting his relationship with God and letting other things, and especially other foreign and false gods, uh, come to the fore in his life and in the worship, uh, consequently, of the people. Uh, there's so much I could say about that, uh, about relating to... Uh, the the day in which we live and even the church in which uh, we find ourselves in the 21st century. But I'm not going to say too much about that. But what does the letter to the Hebrews say? How is it put here? That these things spoken by our Lord were confirmed by those who heard him. Those who were witnesses to his teaching, to the promises of God, and what is more to the fulfillment of these promises, those who were there on the morning of the resurrection, like Peter and uh, James and John and Mary Magdalene and others, they were there when Jesus spoke of his death, but they were also there when he died. They were there at the tomb, and they saw it sealed maybe, and they were there at the tomb on the morning of the resurrection to see that he is not there. He has risen. So that was something that was alongside the word of God, the word of Christ, that the witness and testimony of the church is unfailing, that there is but only one Saviour, only one Lord, the word of Christ, the witness of the church, but also we see in the New Testament the work and the witness of the Holy Spirit. We read there in this passage, God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. When we think of God the Holy Spirit and asking what the Holy Spirit does, he does this, he witnesses. 
He testifies to Jesus Christ as God's Son and he points a needy world to a Saviour, as surely the Church does too. And the signs and the wonders of the Holy Spirit, of God the Holy Spirit, will always speak of Jesus and will witness and will testify to God's great salvation. And that is why we will not escape if we neglect this great salvation. When uh, other things are more important, when uh, these things even that the letter to the Hebrews speaks of the various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit are bearing witness to what? To the healing ministry of an evangelist? No. They are bearing witness to the Saviour, to Jesus, the Son of God, who has been, as we read later on in that passage, made a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and with honour and set him over the works of your hands. This is our God and the question that only we can answer personally and privately. How shall we escape if we neglect so great this salvation? And we pray that God would bless his word to us this evening.